All right, music in the Bible. And uh, this probably won't be a very long lesson, so you can get home and watch the rest of that conference. <laughs> okay. Music in the Bible. And uh, I want to first start with this threefold purpose of church music. Threefold purpose of church music. I mean, it just makes common sense, but then you also see it as you go through the Bible and you come across different uh, places in the Bible where music is used. These are the three, I mean, there's secular music, but I'm talking about when it comes to church music, okay? Because we're talking about tonight uh, music as ministry, all right? A ministry, it's either going to be a ministry to God or to others. So here we go. Here's a threefold purpose. I'm going to give you the three blanks, and then we're going to look at the scriptures, and I'll explain why in a minute. Pray To praise and worship God, that's obvious. Our music, we're singing to the Lord and we're giving thanks to the Lord, and so that's obviously one of the purposes of church music, to praise and worship God, to encourage and exhort believers. Obviously, that's a command even to sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and uh, to exhort one another. And then the, finally, to declare God's Word to unbelievers. That's actually a ministry of music. Now, I'll say this. Uh, there's this mentality out there now that's like, well, let's... Uh, and I was just watching this guy today uh, giving a commentary on uh, Kanye West and his, you know, what he's doing with his music or whatever. And this guy was saying, saying, man, this is such a great opportunity for Christians to use music to put out the gospel. And I, I, something just kind of stands out to me whenever I hear people say that, like, that's really not how it works, right? Because God's music typically isn't going to be something that attracts the world to come and want to listen to that. And if it does, it makes me wonder, well, what's, what's going on here? It's kind of like whenever everybody wants to hear a certain preacher, you know, something's not right. That guy's only preaching soft, sweet stuff, leaving something out. The Bible says all those that live godly suffer persecution. And we understand that, that it's the, the message isn't always going to be all sweet. So same as, as singing. If the world just loves that music, even if it's called Christian music, I think there's a disconnect. There's something that's not right. So, so God's word, when we sing it to declare God's righteousness, that's great. But I don't think that that means use that as a mode of evangelism. You know, I just don't think that's typically going to be uh, the case. At the same time, there have been people that have listened to like Handel's Messiah. And there are stories of where they, that actually brought them to the Lord. Of course, that's straight scripture right out of the King James Bible. right? And, and it's a really beautiful piece of music well written. I've heard people use that as they're defending uh, reasons why uh, there is a God, like, like trying to, if you're talking to an atheist and explaining reasons why there's a God. And actually one of the arguments people use is some of the great pieces of music that are out there. And they refer, refer to something like Handel's work or, you know, something that was inspired where these guys said that they were influenced by God or whatever. So the point is, that the music and, and just putting all those notes together and, and something that is actually creates a, mo a mode of, of worship. And it's just like the, the natural, the, the, I mean, we are part of the natural world, but the animal, animals can't produce that. I mean, they can do some amazing things and, and create some really nice music, but to put notes to, together in such a sophisticated way. Uh, anyway, I'm just saying that I've heard people re re refer to how beautiful a piece of music is as evidence that there's even a God, which sounds kind of like a strange argument. So, so there is a sense in which it declares God's word. Music can declare God's word to the unbelievers. Now let's look at the scriptures, and I'll, I'll show you why I didn't want to just give them to you one at a time, because some of them go hand in hand. And uh, so if you see Psalm 95, I forgot to turn there, sorry. And look at verse 1. And two, it says, uh, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Look at 90, chapter 96. O sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Who, who are we singing to, right? We're singing to the Lord. This song that we're singing is to the Lord. But it says, show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. So even though they're singing to the Lord 
And you could compare this, which we're going to look at, uh, go ahead and, t uh, well, let's wait a second. When we look at Ephesians and Colossians, he's saying the same thing. He's saying you're singing one to another, and it says making melody in your heart unto the Lord. So you see, even in our singing to the Lord, it's declaring to other people, you know, and, and if there's lost people there, unbelievers there, uh, we're declaring it to the heathen even, right? So look at uh, Acts, very f popular verse here. It's supposed to say Acts 16. Sorry about that. Acts chapter 16. And you're familiar with this story. Uh, Paul and Silas are in prison. And it says, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And look at this. And the prisoners heard them. Right? So they're just singing to God, encouraging one another, no doubt about that. And then others are hearing that and being influenced by that. So you see all three of these purposes of church music and singing to God, whatever, can even happen in the same moment. They're singing praises to God, encouraging one another, strengthening one another, and declaring God's word to the believer. It's possible to do all three of those. All right. So let's look at Ephesians 5 now. And you know that Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 are parallel passages. They say very similar things, but we're going to look at both of them. Ephesians 5. Starting in verse 18, it says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our, Je of our Lord Jesus Christ. So look over at Colossians now, a couple pages over probably. Colossians chapter 3, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. 16, let the word of Christ uh, dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. We talked about last week how singing is a great teaching tool. Uh, singing and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. So they're singing to the Lord, and yet it's still a teaching tool to, uh, to teach others. And so those are the three uh, purposes of church music. One more, uh, Psalm 145. Psalm 145, and of course... Under declaring God's word to the unbeliever, we could also go to uh, go back to Psalm 96 and Acts 16. Psalm 145. I should just have somebody read it. All right, and verse four it says, "One generation shall praise thy works to another." and shall declare thy mighty acts. And I'm sure I could dig down into that and preach a whole message on that, that verse, but I like the idea of singing, one generation singing to another, where you get this idea of almost like teaching another generation. Hey, look what the great things that God's done. And sometimes, uh, sometimes singing in, in a song can just, I mean, think about the songs in our songbook. You know, somebody one time said something about... Uh, uh, when are we going to sing the old songs? Right? We were in the nursing home, and I was singing some songs, and they were like, well, when are we going to sing the old songs? And what's funny is what they meant by the old songs were songs that they used to sing long ago that were written like in the 40s and 50s. And I'm like, actually, all the songs we just sang were written in like the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s. But they're just saying like, we, you know, they seem new because we're, we're just learning them or whatever. They're saying, what about those old songs? But the thing is, songs have kind of immortalized some biblical truths. And when we sing songs, and look, even, even the uh, contemporary movement, uh, uh, Christian, contemporary Christian singers or whatever, I'll, if you notice, a lot of them are realizing, hey, we can't write songs any better than they used to. So they're re regurgitating some of the old songs and just kind of putting a modern spin on it or whatever. But they're like, hey, you can't do better than some of those songs, right? Now, the Bible says a lot about singing a new song unto the Lord. So I believe in, hey, we should be constantly coming up with new, fresh things. I, I think that's good. But, I, but you know, hey, we, we're not going to necessarily get any better than some of the stuff that's already out there. 
uh, especially the songs that are just straight out of the Bible. <laughs> we, were, we were talking about this, I think, because last week we sang one of the Psalms, and we were going through all the songs that we know of that are just straight out of the Bible. There's a lot of songs. Some would be in the song, song book. Most of them would be ones that we just learn. You know, maybe it's something that the, uh, my wife and daughter sang as a special at church or something like that. Straight out of the Scripture. And Valerie was playing earlier Micah, uh, Micah 6, 8. Micah 6, 8, right? He has shown the old man what is good and what did the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with my, my God. Hey, I'm going back to last week's lesson, right? <laughs> Singing really helps us memorize, memorize verses. And so, like, ver songs like that that are just straight Scripture, right? You can't ever improve on God's Word. And so that's great. But then to me, you know, you got psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And that gives you a little bit of a variety, right? You got songs right out of the psalms in your Bible, the actual psalms singing the Word of God. And then you got, you know, uh, uh, spiritual songs, just songs that have a spiritual message. I mean, uh, there's different ways. A lot of people have interpreted those things differently. But then hymns, you know, uh, that have a godly message. I mean, even Jesus... And at the Last Supper, before they dismissed, before they, they went their separate ways, they sang a hymn, right? And so we see all throughout the Bible this idea. All right, so let me look at this. Uh, you got your three blanks there. B, church music, then and now. Then and now. And I had it divided. It was just going to take way too long, and I don't want to do another lesson. But I had it divided into, like, music before the temple you know, music in the temple and music after the temple. But, uh, but really, I think we can just kind of mix it all in here. So here we go. Music today isn't all that far removed from the music of Bible days. You might think it is. I mean, a lot of people think back to, through church history and they're like, oh, well, it was just like the Gregorian chants back then and just everybody, oh, da, 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 you know, some Latin song or something. And then like, that's just how everybody sang. No, that's how the Catholics sang in the whatever century they started singing like that, I don't know. But really, if you look at the Bible, you're seeing that they have instruments that are pretty close to the instruments we have today. Now, I'm not saying the music sounded exactly the same. Uh, culturally, there are certain notes and uh, uh, patterns of, of uh, uh, what's that? Modes, there you go, certain modes like uh, uh, that you'll hear an Eastern sound to it or, or something like that. And throughout history, I'm sure that's changed. We've built off of uh, of other, uh, other, you know, cultures and stuff like that to give us what we have today. But when you look at the, in the Bible, you see, that's kind of surprising, the similarities. All right, so consider the instruments that are used throughout the Bible. We have string instruments. That's your next blank. String instruments. Now, I'm sure some of you all know this already, but the, you know, the piano is actually a string instrument. Uh, it is basically just a harp on its side, and when you, uh, I think some people call it a percussion. Is it actually percussion? Because when you hit the, it's actually like a little hammer going down on those notes, so it's a cross between a string instrument and a percussion instrument. But anyway, it doesn't sound a whole lot different. If you hear somebody playing a harp and they're really skilled at it, sometimes it, hey, that sounds like a piano, right? Because it's the same concept. So in the Bible, all throughout, we have string instruments. We got the psaltery and the harp, I think those are very similar. A dulcimer, which would be more like a piano because a dulcimer was actually like a harp. They, they banged on with the, uh, some kind of a uh, drum. Whatever. <laughs> I don't know what the thing's called that they use. Okay, we have wind instruments. Should have Valor teach that part. No, that's, that wouldn't be right. Wind instruments. What are wind instruments? Well, the Bible actually talks about flutes. We use those today, right? And uh, I think like I don't know how far back it goes, but I think if we look into like Jesus's day, uh, what you find through just pictures and, and like uh, images on coins and other artifacts and whatever, uh, one of the flutes that they played was like a two. It was like double flute. And they would play, you know, one thing on one hand, one on the other hand, and uh, probably just sounded like a lot like flutes today. <laughs> you know, you just got two, uh, two of them playing or whatever. They, they use a lot of the same uh, things. Percussion instruments. Uh-oh, we're Baptists. Are we allowed to have percussions? Well, the Bible talks about bells and cymbals and drums, you know, and, and, and what did they all look like? Well, I mean, 
Timbrels is one I didn't put on there, but a timbrel was like a little bell, you know, of some sort, and and uh, they actually had uh, uh, tambourine type things. I don't know if the Bible actually says tambourine. What's the word it would use? I can't think of what it is, but like uh, I guess maybe that was timbrel, right? Because it talks about um, uh, Moses' sister Miriam, right? And she had the timbrels, right? And they and they began to sing. I'm just doing it like the <laughs> like the Pentecostal, like oh, though. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so I don't know how they played it, but, uh, uh, but they had the percussion instruments. They do. Consider this, the singing that was used. You say, oh, okay, well, that, that must have been completely different. Well, uh, you know, we talked a lot about uh, music and, and the importance of singing and, and making, you know, the words meaning something and teaching people something. We talked about that last, last uh, lesson. But how about choirs? Number two there is choir. A choir of voices were used in the temple, and I could show you a lot of other places, not to mention a choir of angels. You got in Revelation, a choir, the 24 elders, and then all the angels singing as well. Holy, 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 and, and uh, there's a lot of uh, where there's choir of voices. But let's look at some verses about the temple here. Uh, let me see here. i tell you what, let's go to Nehemiah first. Okay, so Nehemiah, oh, no, no, no. Hold your place in Nehemiah if you're already there. Nehemiah 12, but let's first go to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. Nehemiah is after that. So, <clears throat> And in the tabernacle, before the temple was ever built, I realized there, were, there were, was also singing. Okay, David appointed singers. Uh, David, even the Psalms, the whole book of Psalms. You know, the Psalms are basically like the sheet music that the choir used. Right? That's the way I understand it. And a lot of it then was put together later and put into a book uh, and obviously inspired by God. But they, it was like their choir music that they used. And, uh, and that's where the original psalms came from. And so, uh, so in the tabernacle, I'm saying that music was used. But then let's look specifically at Second Chronicles here at the temple. Second Chronicles. I started talking again. Forgot to turn. You're there. Second Chronicles 5. And let's look at verse 12. All right. Also, the Levites. Now, who are the Levites? The Levites are the priests, right? Their job was to serve in the temple. Various things. Some of them would bring the, uh, the incense. Some of them would do all these different things. Some would do the sacrifices. They all had specific jobs according to their families, you know, and they'd be taught probably from a very young age, you know, what their job is in the temple. Well, here's what it says. Also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph. We talked about him last week. He's one of the head, head uh, uh, musicians of David. And then we talked about He-Man. These are guys that you see in, this, in the uh, book of Psalms. And the reason why is because these were guys, you know, in families that they would teach people the music. And the entire tribes of, of Levites, or not tribes, the uh, entire families of Levites were dedicated to this, to this task. So Asaph, Heman, uh, Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen. All right? Nothing wrong with choir robes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps. Uh, they stood at and stood at the east end of the altar, and with them an hundred and twenty priests sounding with trumpets. It came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trump with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good; for His mercy endureth forever that then the house was filled with the cloud, even the house of God, I mean, house of the Lord, sorry, so that the priests could not stand uh, to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Okay, so you see this, that was their job. This is one instance where the glory of the Lord just filled the house, but I'm saying this was their job regularly, and I talked about this last week, but if, if I understand right, I didn't find those verses, but... Uh, they were supposed to do that around the clock, 24 hours a day. It was their job. Uh, not everybody at the same time, but probably had shifts to do that. And so these guys, were their job was to sing. And it says, uh, as one, 
they got the trumpets and all these things playing, and they're singing along with them, right? As one, or you could say maybe in unison or whatever, and they're singing out this message of the Lord and declaring it. Basically, you know what they're doing? They're preaching, all right? But they're preaching something in a specific way. Uh, I remember uh, uh, a church I, I was at in uh, Springfield, South Campbell Avenue Baptist Church, and, and they were the ones that really brought this idea to my mind, I had never heard this before, but ministering in song. And they were saying, basically, you know, those who are ministering in song is just as important as somebody preaching. You know, they're actually getting up there and they're delivering a message and all. And, and so that's, it's serving the Lord, right? This is a ministry uh, that we have is singing. Now, I do find it interesting. I'm not against solos, uh, but you don't really see that a lot in the Bible. Most of the time when you see singers, you see multiple people singing together. And I don't know that I could make some kind of doctrine about that, but I will say that it gets real easy when one person is standing up in front of everybody, it becomes a show. And it becomes like, you know, look at me, look how good I am. I remember going to a funeral in Oklahoma City, one of our bus kids, actually the, the bus kid and his mom were driving on the road and uh, had an accident and they both died immediately. And so we went to their funeral and the whole thing was a show. I mean, number one, the, every church that these guys had ever been to, there was some representative that got up there. And it was like, I'd like to say something. And you think, oh, he's going to tell some sad story about, you know, the, the, the family. And then he gets up there and he's like, you know, they came to our church one time. And I want to tell you, if you don't have a church, like you ought to come to our church because our church is the best church. And they <laughs> use this like five, ten minutes as like an... <laughs> at someone's funeral to, she's shaking her head because I'm not lying and then the next guy would get up and I'm like okay well this guy same thing well they also came to our church and you know our church is better than their church <laughs> it was just like ridiculous okay so then it was like now we're going to have a couple songs and somebody would get up there and they'd have their soundtrack and they would sing the song and they it was all a show and you could tell by the way they're dressed the way that they're looking at everybody it was like look at me now look sometimes in church Solos can get like that as well. And not just that, but even trios and quartets and all that, it can get so showy. And you're looking up there, just, you know, look at me and I got to look a certain way and I'm trying to get your attention. Look, we don't have any time for that. That's not ministering to anybody. That's just self serving and wrong. And I'm going to talk about that here in a few minutes. But, uh, but it was a ministry. And so I like a good choir. I mean, I, I guess a choir can do that too. You know, they could start thinking about themselves and look how good I sound or something. But I like the idea of a choir where it's like, hey, this is their ministry, you know, or an ensemble or whatever. And they're just all trying to serve by praising the Lord, right? Encouraging brothers and sisters in Christ and declaring God's word to unbelievers that might be there, right? I mean, this is the threefold purpose of music. So uh, we see singing for sure. We see choirs. Nehemiah. Now, let's let's... Let's skip that for the sake of time, okay? Nehemiah, though, you know, in Ezra's day, they go back into the land after 70 years of captivity. And when they go into the land, they kind of make this makeshift temple. It's not a very good temple at this point, but they make this temple, and then they establish that. There's kind of like a little revival where they read the, uh, the Word of God, and all the people are there. And then again, they, they appoint all the singers and stuff like that that came back into the land. And they have their job of, of uh, singing in this big choir, basically. <clears throat> it's a really good passage, but uh, you have to read it on your own. All right. I don't have a lot on this next point. And it's not because I'm afraid to talk about it, because I'm not. But the Bible also say, talks about dancing. Consider the forms of dancing that are used. And I could show you a few different places. Obviously, Miriam is an example. Uh, we don't see a whole lot in the New Testament by, by, by way of actually a ministry in the church. Uh, but we do see kind of a natural uh, expression of like, uh, you know, think about little kids. You know, when they're excited about something and they're leaping and they're, and they're doing all this. And the Bible talks about singing unto the Lord and it talks about clapping unto the Lord. Right. And it talks about doing all, all, all these all these types of expressions. Uh, from what I understand, I'm not a go back to the Greek type of a guy, but the word has to do with circle. 
right? And so you think about that idea about the dancing and the leaping around and jumping in circles, and sometimes even a group of people would go around in a circle, and it was a festive time. You know, we talked about music as a festive celebration, just a time of doing that. So sometimes dancing was involved. David dancing before the Lord, right, whenever the Ark of the Covenant was taken back to Jerusalem. And it was just a way of getting excited and expressing that excitement. Now, the reason we don't do much dancing today in churches, you know, you see it every once in a while in a church. I'm not talking about just people, you know, getting into the music and swaying back and forth. That's kind of a dancing too. But I'm talking about like actually there are some churches where they'll call in these, these dancers to get up on the stage and dance in front of everybody. And I think that's weird, okay? Uh, <laughs> you might be able to find some scripture in the Bible that talk about dancing and everything, but our society today, this brings me to my next point, right, is the reason why we just eliminate a lot of that kind of stuff. And it's the same reason, for instance, why we eliminate drums. You know, why don't you believe in having drums in the church? Don't you know there were drums in the Bible? Well, yeah, but the way drums are used today, you know, it, it speaks to our culture in a negative way. So let's look at what the next point on that. <coughs> Where today's church music misses the mark. Today's church music misses the mark. And anyone that just, uh, I think I'm in good company here, but anyone that would have a preference one way or another, hey, listen to this whole thing because there's a, there's a ditch on both sides of the road, okay? But here's where I believe church music misses the mark, okay? Not all, we understand this, not all music is honoring and glorifying to God. Now, some people will say, yeah, but see, music is all moral. You know, there's not good music and bad music. There's just music, right? Uh, and so, you know, at the same time, you know, I, I think a good case could be made. And I like to bring out how in Ephesians 5, he says, Be not drunk with wine, where is it excess? But be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking of Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, right? Being drunk with wine is a bad thing, right? <laughs> right? So, and then he compares that to, Music, which is a good thing, right? Uh, now, could music be used for bad? Yeah. Could grapes be used for good? Yeah. But when somebody turns those grapes into wine and drinks wine and gets drunk, that's a bad thing. Do you understand? Anything can be used, good or bad, right? And so, uh, and so we got to be careful, you know, not to have this mentality. But it's just music. So as long as it's got godly words, you know, it's good music. I would disagree with that, okay? And so today's church music, let's first give a couple examples from the Bible uh, that I think are good examples. <laughs> you know, it might be a little bit of a stretch here in Exodus 32, but let's go there. Examples in the Bible of music that's not glorifying to God. I think it's kind of a strange sound to God, I guess. Exodus 32, look at verse 17. Great story. Love this passage. Moses and Joshua are up on the mountain. Of course, Moses is farther than Joshua. And he's receiving the commandments from the Lord. And then all of a sudden we know that he left his assistant pastor down there. And his assistant pastor is helping the people build a golden calf. Man, you've got to make sure you get the right, the right deacon <laughs> in your church, right? While he's gone, you don't want somebody building the golden calf. <clears throat> and so, uh, uh, so he gets back, and there's and, and, and you know God's kind of told him something's going on down there. So now they're go they're heading back down the the mountain. And in verse eighteen, uh, uh, verse seventeen, when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, "There's a noise of war in the camp." Now, what are some sounds that you hear in war? You hear there's, you know, victory, right? Yeah, I mean, there's cheering and rejoicing. Then in war, you also hear the people that are losing the battle, you know, screaming and shouting because they're being killed or whatever. I don't know. So here's what he says in verse 18. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither it is the voice of them that cry for being overcome. But the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' Moses's anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hand and brake them uh, beneath the mount. And he took the calf which, which they had made and burned it in the fire. 
and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not uh, the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they were uh, they are set on mischief, for they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go forth uh, go before us. For as this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, no God brought you up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let him break it off. So they gave it to me, and I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. <laughs> Who believes that, Aaron? I didn't have to read all this, but I just wanted to because I like it. <laughs> and when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. Uh-huh, Aaron, how are you going to explain that one? <laughs> they just, their clothes just fell off. <laughs> And, me, and Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who's on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. All right, I had to read all that. But basically, the point I wanted to make is that there's some sort of music and singing going around the fire there, right, where the golden calf is being made. And for some reason, this singing sounds from afar off like it's warfare. <laughs> there's either shouting for victory. No, that's not quite what it sounds like. Shouting because they're being overcome by the enemy. No, that's not quite what it sounds like. I think there's just singing, right? I can't quite tell. Is it singing or shouting? Does that sound like any kind of music that you can think of? <laughs> <laughs> and while they're doing this, there's obviously dancing going on. Now, we've already showed that not all dancing is necessarily bad. But look, this kind of dancing causes them to take their clothes off. <laughs> Does that remind you of any kind of music being sung today? Even in churches, right? There's churches where that style of music makes you feel like, man, we're in a, a club somewhere and everybody's going to start uh, t t taking off their clothes or something because music can make people want to do those kinds of things and think those kinds of thoughts. And it doesn't matter if you put godly words in it. You could sing straight scripture, but there's a type of music out there that creates that same atmosphere and that same feeling. And so if you feel that, something's not right. That music can't be godly, <laughs> right? That uh, music is causing me to have uh, 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 the wrong kinds of feelings. So that's your next blank there. Much of it has embraced the sensual. Now, sensual doesn't mean sexual. Sensual just has to do with the senses, all right? So, uh, but often that's what it does, just the lust of the flesh and what have you, and self-gratifying influences of the world. Now, I won't take the time to read Daniel 3, but if you go to Daniel 3, you realize that's the place where Nebuchadnezzar is wanting everyone to bow down to the, to the image there. And he says, but at the time that you hear the sackbut and the psaltery and the harp, and these are all instruments that I mentioned a, a minute ago, when you hear all those instruments playing, right, then you'll bow down and worship. So obviously there's a music out there that's got uh, the wrong type of message in it, right? The song that's going to lead you to worship the wrong uh, the wrong God or something like that. And see, we usually as Christians recognize, hey, that song is talking garbage, it's talking about bad things, it's worshiping uh, the world or, or the bad, bad things of this world. And so we usually dismiss that, but it's that other kind of music that a lot of times Christians will fall for and they'll say, well, it's good godly music. Look at these words. They're really good words. They're singing to God, the right God and all that. But the style can even influence them to these unholy feelings. Okay? That's why we want to be real strict. Even though Drums aren't bad. Yeah, but we want to be careful because I hardly hear drums nowadays played in such a way that's God-honoring, right? It's possible. It is possible, uh, but it's, it's rare. And, uh, and that's why we don't allow people to get up and start dancing because it just brings either chaos or, or sensual feelings. And, and so, like, you know, if a kid's jumping around dancing, you know, I'd tolerate that. If Baptist pastors are running around the altar, I, I think something's weird with that, <laughs> right? But so no, I'm just dancing for the Lord. No, you're acting like a fool in the house of God where things are supposed to be done decently and in order. But anyway, that's another message for another day. <laughs> so, uh, so here are uh, some thoughts on that. Some influences of today's music, some influences have literally been taken from uh, uh, heathen cultures 
such as animism uh, or spiritism, whatever you want to call it. That's, that's what animism is, like just worshiping spirits. And I mean, think about these cultures in Africa, right? And I'm not knocking Africa. I love Africans. But let's think about the culture, the heathen culture, animism, witch doctors, all this kind of stuff, all right? Uh, a lot of those were forced into slavery. Some of them sold their own families into slavery. So, I mean, they're not all without fault there. But they were sold into slavery, and they were taken, uh, brought to America, sold. Terrible thing, okay? We, we understand that. And then people started listening to some of this, uh, the, some of the influence from that culture, and they're hearing some of that, and it, they're saying, hey, man, that sounds pretty great, right? Which brought in eventually jazz and blues, which led to rock and roll, right? And Elvis Presley was like the first white person that ever like embraced that style and that song. And, the, and then all of a sudden, like, think about where the times were, okay? And it's unfortunate that our society was there, but there was such a division based on color that all of a sudden when there was a white guy doing it, then all the whole world was like, oh, yeah, it's okay. We can let our kids listen to that. And, and really that was kind of like the history of rock and roll. You can look all that up. But now, is everything about jazz wrong? Not at all. I think you could probably tie in a lot of jazz, blues, stuff like that. And a lot of those things you could take back to the Middle Eastern culture and maybe even back to the times of Christ. I don't know. We just don't really have those records back then, that, the, the record of that, that kind of music. We don't know what it sounded like. But you could take the instruments, you could take drums, all that, you know. So, uh, so are all those wrong? Not at all, you know. However, we do know that there are some bad cultures whether you're talking about Hindus, you know, uh, Buddhists. Look, think about the influence. I, I, I talked about rock and roll. You know how much the Beatles, for instance, were influenced by uh, when they went to India. They picked up a bunch of uh, influence from Buddhists and Hinduism, which is pretty much the same thing. And look, a lot of their music started bringing in that element into the music. You say, well, but wait a minute, but all the instruments, you know, we already said it's not bad. And the that's true, right? But when you bring all that together and it starts sounding so similar to something that is heathen or worshiping false gods or sensual and causing uh, uh, wicked thoughts or whatever. Um, anyway, so we understand that that is one of the reasons that our music today is, is kind of really dangerous as far as our spiritual, uh, the way that, that it affects us. Much of it, much of the... Uh, I already got into this a little bit, but much of the um, influence of our modern music comes from the sexual revolution, which was that whole rock and roll era, okay, where all of a sudden it was like, oh, right? And, and, and here's what, I, I, I watched a lot of documentaries on this uh, about rock and roll, and here's what they all admit. Rock and roll was totally rebellious, totally about rebellion. And they will tell you that themselves. People that were kids during that age, uh, I mean, they were kids at that time of, of our history, and they told their parents, and I've, a lot of them are on record admitting this, like, well, yeah, we told our parents, you know, hey, well, this is just a way to express ourselves. There's nothing bad about this. You know, we're just enjoying it. It's a way to have a good time. They said, but we knew in our heart, and these aren't Christian people saying this. They were like, we knew in our heart we were just totally rebelling against our families and all the morals that they had and all the, uh, you know, and obviously in the 40s and 50s and 60s, 60s is when it really took off. Uh, look, there was already a lot of evil going on. There was a lot of people not going to church that didn't believe in God. All that stuff was there. Right. But their morals as a society, even in their music, believe it or not, for the most part, stayed pretty conservative. Now, conservative in itself isn't a, doesn't mean good, but you understand where that comes from. It's like today when I, if I would talk to an atheist and they say, well, look, you don't have to be a Christian to have good morals. You know, I'm a good person and I don't believe in God. I'm going to say, well, what about your mom and dad? Did they believe in God? Well, yeah. OK, so they taught you. Christian morals. And so you know how to live right because you were taught Christian morals. Okay? So there was a time where even non-believers were like, no, man, that's, that's some wicked music. <laughs> you know, let's not, let's not go down that route. You sound, like, you sound like a rebel. You know, you sound like one of them hippies. And they were saying that. But at some point they said, well, yeah, I don't really see anything wrong with this. It's just music. They're just having fun. And so they just totally just opened up the door 
for what became this sexual revolution, which was nothing more than just absolute rebellion, right? And now we know that it opened up the world of drugs, it opened up the world of all kind of immoral uh, activities, and opened up the door of, of uh, believe it or not, uh, the sodomites, right? And I'm not talking about just, I mean, really, when you give yourself over to rebellion, rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, right? So you've easily become reprobate at that point. You look at what happened, and then you came into the disco era in the 70s, and then all of a sudden it's just like this influx you know, and it was funny because when AIDS first came out, they called it the gay people disease. That's what they called it. Like you ask any older, older person, and they, that's what they said. And, it, and they all recognize it, the judgment of God, right? And what it was is just total immorality just opened up. And you say, well, how could music? And it wasn't music. I realized that it was the whole culture. But embracing the culture as a Christian is a dangerous thing to do. And so why would we want to embrace something that's so wicked? And, and now, you know, you see... Uh, it doesn't matter if it's if it's hip hop, you know, if it's rap. A lot of churches embrace that, and it's like, what are you doing? <laughs> Why would you want to bring that into the church? You know, it's it's not good. And so it doesn't matter if you have Christian words to it; it could open up the door. And again, I realize music is just music, instruments are just instruments. But if it's put in a certain way, you know, and I don't have time to get into it, but uh, I believe that the devil is like. I mean, he is, uh, there's evidence in the Bible that he is the cherub that his job was. It says he's built with pipes in him and all this kind of stuff. Like maybe his job, uh, it says he's the cherub that covereth. I can't remember all the verses, but, uh, but there's good indication that he is like, he was in charge of music, right? Which would make sense if you think about it. Because the, in, the whole music industry, man, if you do, a, do a, much of a study on that, I mean, a lot of these guys literally, like, I sold my soul to the devil to get into this industry. And you say, well, that's a conspiracy theory. I mean, you, you look at them up. Some of these guys produce some sounds, I mean, with their voice, some sounds that aren't even normal. <laughs> like, where did that sound come from? You know, and some abilities and some skills, uh, all of it takes practice, I realize. But some people have this, this weird, eerie, like, level of talent that you're like, man, who gave them that talent to do something so wicked? I tell you who gave them that talent, the God of this world, right? And so it doesn't surprise me one bit. I want to stay away from anything like that, anything that would lead to opening up the door uh, to allow that into the church. Now, here's the, the other end of that spectrum. To combat this, many have become too rigid and restrictive on what music should be allowed in the church. I grew up independent Baptist. I've seen... My dad uh, was in the military, so we traveled a lot. We weren't just church hopping, but we were in a lot of churches growing up because out of necessity, we had to relocate, find another church. They were all independent fundamental Baptists, right? My wife grew up independent fundamental Baptist, and we've shared stories, and I know that she can, uh, she will agree with me on some of this. But there are a lot of independent fundamental Baptist churches that had good motives for wanting to control the music in their church. Good motives for wanting to be strict and wanting to, you know, make sure. And you could take this back all the way to the time of the Reformation. And you know there were actually churches, still are today, that were teaching no instruments. Instruments are wicked. Instruments are evil. To this day, some people say, like, I don't see instruments uh, used in worship in the New Testament. Like, look in the book of Acts. I don't see them, like, sing they're singing, right, with their voices. I don't see them using instruments. And I'm like, they're in jail. <laughs> you know? They're hiding out in houses and stuff like that. Yeah, they don't have instruments. They're not blowing on trumpets, right? They're singing with their voices. But now we don't have that, <laughs> you know, that limitation. We have instruments. And the, we can look at the Old Testament. Uh, we can look at Jesus talking about instruments. He didn't ever say anything bad about them. He talked about people playing on flutes and harps and stuff. And so, some people will say, oh, no, we should never use instruments. They're evil. Maybe their motivation was good. Like, we don't want to open up this door for this heathen-type uh, music and wickedness. But we know that instruments can be used to glorify God. Some of them, uh, now, obviously, our society has changed a lot. But, you know, when anything, any new technology comes out, there's always the hardcore Baptists that are like, that's wicked. You know? <laughs> the Internet, oh, what are you better stay away from that. That's of the devil. You know, uh, 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 amplification, right? That's wicked. And every time the, every time the microphone's like, they're like, oh, demons are in the wires, <laughs> you know? 
And there are people that took it to that extreme to the point where even today there are some people that are like, oh, we don't amplify our music. We don't do anything like that. We don't believe in any kind of high tech. This would be a big no-no, right? Because that's electric and people use that for wicked and stuff like that. And look, we can take that too far. We don't want to go on <laughs> to that point where, we're, where we just over uh, micromanage everybody's lives and what they do, okay? Uh, there are some people that no rhythm or beat of any kind. And I don't even mean like no... Uh, no percussion instruments, but music has a certain, I mean, there has to be some rhythm, but I'm saying uh, some people are very much against, and I remember teaching this, and Valerie and I have talked about this a lot. Now, I will say, uh, I don't know how much you know about uh, music and all, and I'm not trying to bore anybody, but there is a type of music, and again, this goes back to the whole, you know, if you study rock and roll and everything, there is a type of uh, sound where the emphasis is on, like, to the, the second beat and the last beat, right? So you got four, four, right? It's like one, two, three, four, right? But then all of a sudden you can add one, two, three, four, one, two. Am I doing that right? I mean, you know, you, there, there are different ways you can accent different beats or you can syncopate a beat where it's like ta-ta, 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 right? Where people will say, no, 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 that's wicked. Any syncopation, anything like that, that's wicked. I do understand that there is a point where that can be used to create a, a bad feeling, but that doesn't mean every time something is syncopated or something is emphasized on the second and the fourth uh, beat or whatever, that that's necessarily wrong. Some people even say no minor chords, right? Because uh, if you play major chords, I should have her give you an example. Go ahead, play a, a chord, I don't know, a D chord or something like that. Major. So you got a major chord, a little louder, do it again. She hits a minor, of course. So that's a major chord, one more time. Okay, right, some people say no minor, give me the minor, right, because they're like, oh, that creates an eerie feel. But see, sometimes a minor can be used, okay, because music also, look at, the, look at the book of Psalms, okay, and you'll find that the Psalms can be categorized singing, lament, lament, lamenting, right? Lamentations. We talked about the dirge. Dirge? Is that the right word? We talked about the dirge last week. Uh, lamenting or praising God, right? So there actually are some songs that are more sorrowful, right? I remember reading this on Facebook one time and some people, it, it, this is a stupid type of a thing to start, okay? I hate, I hate these kinds of things, but they're like, you know, what kind, what songs in our songbook need to go or something like that? It was just opening up the door to like criticize the songs in the songbook, which uh, don't get me wrong. There are some songs that need to go, but what they all started doing, just picking any song that was like, you know, discouraging or man, what was that song? There's a song that, that it is very like, uh, it's an old, like really pushing you towards missions. And it's talking about like not having anything. Can you think of what that is? If she can find that, I'll read that to you. But, but there are some songs or that, or, or we sing a song that's like, uh, are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day, right? And the last verse is like, there's a sad day coming, a sad day coming. It's talking about how people are going to die and go to hell, and that's a sad day, right? Uh, what is it? That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me read that page for me, and I'm going to read that. And so, so there are songs that are like jubilant and happy and songs that are, so there could be a use of a minor chord. You understand, I hope I'm not taking this too far, but uh, there are some uses of different things in music to create a certain feeling, right? But we should know as Christians when something is an unholy feeling or a righteous feeling, right? So here's one of the songs that was really criticized in that Facebook post I was telling you about. They're like, oh, what a depressing song. Who wants to sing that in church? Right, and here's what it says, and I'm going to tell you, it's rough, right? It's written in, the, it's written in 1937, which uh, would have been a time where really just an emphasis of mission works and in, the, in the, the churches that were really dedicated. So send I you to labor unrewarded, to serve unpaid, unloved, unsought, unknown, to bear rebuke, to suffer scorn and scoffing. So send I you to toil for me alone. <laughs> that's not a positive only message, right? But that's a great song. So send I you to bind the bruised and broken or wandering souls to work, to weep, to wake, to bear the burdens of a world a weary. So send I you to suffer for my sake. You're like, whoa, where's the good part? How about the last verse? So send I you to hearts made hard by hatred, 
to eyes made blind because they will not see, to spin though it be blood, uh, to spin and spare not, so send I you to taste of Calvary. You say, what in the world? I don't want to sing that kind of song. Well, what did Jesus say to his disciples, right? He gathered his disciples together to preach the Sermon on the Mount, and he said, guess what? I'm sending you into uh, like lambs before wolves, and I'm sending you to suffer persecution, and I'm sending you to give things up and to suffer for the Lord. And, there, and some people said, man, I can't, I can't do that. And he said, okay, yeah, you don't have to, all right, you know, but... For those who want to follow God, they're willing to give all. Anyway, so, so not every message, just like not every message we preach, is all about praise and jubilant and happy, joyful, right? Some messages we preach are hard to hear. So there's different types of music, but what we want to not go too far as to say, like, well, you can't ever sing that type of song, or you can't ever have music that is, uh, uh, you know, depressing or a minor chord or whatever. But look, the bottom line is this. Music should, the way that, the, what I mean music is, is the, the accompaniment and everything uh, that goes along with the message of song, right? It should be a good representation of what the lyrics are. Does that make sense? I've seen songs out there where the, song, the words are good, but the, the, the style of music doesn't match the words at all, right? The, the way that, if you were writing a song, that's one important thing is however this sound, whatever this sounds like, we want it to match what the words to this song are. Okay, so that, that should be the case. The, the instrumentation, the accompaniment, all that should serve as, as a way to just spring, for, spring forth and declare that message that you're singing, right? Because again, it's a ministry. We're using that to praise God. Well, if we're praising God, why do we need... Uh, you know, something that is sensual and fleshly, right? We're praising God. We don't need all that. We are admonishing and encouraging one another, right? So we're going to sing songs that so, sound kind of sometimes like a march, like a, you know, a battle song, you know? That, the words to that song are probably going to have a marching type of a song to it, you know? I could almost hear a drum with that song. Some songs are going to be uh, you know, more minor and de almost depressing because some messages are that way. But basically, we need to use our music, particularly in the church, but use our music as a ministry, ministry to the Lord, ministry to our brothers, and in a ministry to the unbelievers, not by giving them some more of their music that they already have, but saying, hey, let me, by my music, declare the Lord unto you you know, and, and they'll hear something and be like, wow, I've never heard that sound. I've never heard that type of music and singing. All right, let's.